Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the second Sunday after Epiphany, which falls on January 15, 2023, are from Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 through 7. The psalm is Psalm 40, 1 through 11. The second reading is 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 9. And then we go off script and go into John for one Sunday here in Epiphany, John 1, 29 through 42. Yeah. So, so. revealing, Epiphany revealing. Yes. Right? Yes. And so when we think about some of the themes, epiphanal, we knew, don't, don't we usually use that word? I think we had epiphanic going for epiphanic, a year or two. Epiphanal, epi, whatever adjective you want to make out of epiphany. When epidural. we have those epidural, I think is the proper way. Of, yeah. I think that's no. not the spelling, but no. go ahead. <laughs> what do I know about these things? Uh, but with this passage in particular, I think there are uh, one. A couple of themes I'll I'll lift up right away, and that is this question that the first words that Jesus says in this gospel are, "What are you looking for? What are you seeking?" And those first words, the first words of anybody, but uh, the first words of Jesus. What difference does it make that these are Jesus' first words in this gospel? And I think it can be a, a an epiphanous. Uh, invitation. What are you seeking? What do you, zeta'o is the verb. What are you, what are you looking for? What do you want to see? What do you want to have man, manifested or, or what do you, uh, what do you don't see? And so I think that that's, I think that's uh, an important theme that we get in this, in this passage. And of course they, they acknowledge him as rabbi. And then they say, where are you staying or where are you abiding? Uh, it was the verb there. And then Jesus says to them, come and see. And so how is it that a preacher can play with that metaphor of epiphany being a coming and seeing? Uh, and what is it that what is it that you are seeking? And that the part but part of that epiphanous moment or that epiphanous experience, I'm just gonna, I'm on a roll here, is is a necessitates an abiding with Jesus. Uh, necessitates a being with Jesus and what, how much more will be revealed because of that. So it's one thing to, it's one thing to see Jesus uh, that, you know, Jesus or John will say, behold, the lamb of God, see, look, behold, the lamb of God. But then, but what will unfold because of that? What will, and what will be, what other manifestations are going to make themselves presence because of that first invitation or that first, what, what do you, uh, what are you seeking for? Or what are you looking for? Or what are you seeking? So I think that's a first, I think, first theme that we, uh, that we get in this gospel um, when you think about epiphany. And I think the second thing is that uh, is to recognize that with the calling of the disciples, which we will get next week too, with Matthew's version of the calling of the disciples, is that, uh, and this continues on through verse 50, so it's just a portion of the calling of the disciples, but that the calling of the disciples, their call is not complete until their witness brings others to Jesus. And I find that also to be really compelling in Epiphany, that this, this call to a baptismal identity that we talked about last week and this call to righteousness and obedient life with God is, uh, is doesn't, it's not just about us. It is about how is it that we then give testimony or witness to uh, and in and in John's gospel, that means come. That's mean invite inviting other people to come and see. So that's another uh, that's another theme that I went with. What do you all think about the I, world's I greatest? Appreciate, I appreciate that, Caroline, and and 
what uh, struck for me uh, was the second one uh, that the um, that our discipleship is not about us, um, and it's in uh, verse thirty one. Um, For this reason, uh, John says, I came uh, that Jesus might be revealed to Israel, and we know that by the end of this gospel, um, that it's not just Israel, but it, Israel is to be the light that the whole world will recognize God in Christ. And so um, I, I really appreciate that. And that was what stuck out for me uh, in, in terms of, uh, if, I, if I lean into the way uh, you began uh, with, uh, what are you looking for? Um, it's a question of, are we looking for our own gain, which is what so much of our culture teaches us to do for our own satisfaction, for our own comfort, for our own advancement, for our own positioning, or for the sake of others to experience the peace that we've experienced and is promised to all. Uh, and I, I really like that. And that struck, strikes me for this passage. What about you, Matt? I like the idea of, you know, that his opening line is, what are you looking for? Because then the next question for me, when I put my pragmatic hat on is then how are we going to get there? Mm. You know, and so there's, there's this inv- interesting invitation, like, what are you looking for? What are you expecting to find? And if, like you said, Carolyn, the answer is going to be, how do you get there? And John is going to be abiding with Jesus. And Mm-hmm. And what that looks like. I'm also, I'm thinking about ways in which this weekend is also the uh, the observance of Martin Luther King's uh, birthday in the United States, at least. And so for a lot of congregations that there's a day of service that's part of the weekend. And, but that's, that strikes me as an interesting, it's an interesting way in which these texts might allow us to say, you know, what are our dreams? Like, what are the things we're bringing forward in terms of what we want? Um, personalized for the sake of the community in which we're situated and to which we're called in the sake of a congregation. And then just to kind of, uh, the Isaiah text can help us with this. The Psalm text can help us with this in particular, but, but to kind of, play, you know, and to think about again, what, and this looks different, of course, for every congregation, but what does the kind of faithfulness to a dream, to a vision that's deeply scriptural that, that King um, obviously preached and lived, how does that now become something that we don't just appropriate nostalgically, but, you know, I, I can't think of a metaphor besides pick up the torch and run with it. You know what I mean? Pick up the baton and run with it. Or kind of, how do you advance that forward? And that has to start with, I think, that question of what do you want? What are you mm-hmm. looking for? It doesn't end there. It's what do our neighbors want, what our neighbors mm-hmm. looking for as well. But that's... I'm working in my head a way in which you could work these texts that fit in ways that fit the season, fit the the biblical books from which they come, but also mm-hmm. have that, um, that prophetic angle and that way of honoring, you know, a, a modern day saint. I I appreciate that parallel, um, and was hoping that you would bring that up, Matt. And um, you've given me a twist that I hadn't thought of. Um, in, in terms of what you just said, um, so we, we began with what are you looking for? What do, what do I want? But you just added on that, what is our neighbor? And when we think of Martin Luther King as simply a civil rights uh, leader, then it's basically for a particular people group to get a particular status. But Martin Luther King, the preacher, um, was actually offering more than just um, the recognition of the humanity and full citizenship of of African Americans. In reality, what he began to do was to go beyond that as he began to talk about the Vietnam War, as he began to talk about um, the situation for workers that included not just Uh, those that have been labeled in our society as Black. And when we begin to care about our neighbor, what benefits us is a benefit to others. And so that, 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 you kind of said that kind of lightly, but that's huge. And it's really what Martin Luther King was about, not simply as talking about 
a small group uh, in society who needed to stop being marginalized, but how treating this group right actually brings wholeness to the whole. Uh, that was redundant, but brings um, fullness to the whole. Um, you, you know, if if I, I won't stay on this, but if if we really pay attention to what happened to our society or what happens to our society in our continued racism and division, it's breaking us down. It's breaking us down politically. It's breaking us down nationally. It's breaking us down economically. And when we begin to see ourselves as one community, everyone is lifted up. And I think that's the power of the gospel that the government doesn't know how to offer us unless the church is prophetic. Well, and that, uh, yeah, and then that, that, prof that prophetic speech, and or as you said, uh, Matt, of, of carrying on, you know, carrying the baton, right, bringing, moving the baton forward, carrying the torch. I, another way we could, we could make those connections is in this text itself, where the primary role of John, not the Baptist, as I like to call him, in John is testifier, is witness. Right. And, and so that the, you know, the first time that Jesus appears in this gospel as, you know, as, as Jesus uh, is, he doesn't speak at all because the focus is on John's testimony, um, which we know from the, from the prologue. I, I came not, I'm not the light, but it came, who came to testify to the light. And so it's, that's what also is uh, deeply embedded in this call, as I talked about, or this baptismal identity, or these, this time of epiphany, and, and this weekend that, uh, that we celebrate the witness, the testimony of, of Martin Luther King, and, and the, what, and, and to what he gave testimony and what, and, and what was he witnessing about and for. And uh, so that, that stance is to what we are called as followers of Jesus, as disciples, which is right here in this passage. Yeah, that was way more Johanna than I was able to articulate. <laughs> I mean, I, but I see that. I, I like going back to the like you said, the introduction of John back in earlier in chapter one as well to help. Again, it's a way you show your congregation. I'm not just making this up, right? I mean, that the text does talk about that kind of way of bearing witness, but especially like you said, the way that John's portrait of John, the, what is it? Not the Baptist, not the Baptist. John the, Baptist, yeah. Yeah. John the witness is, uh, is doing what he does. Um, yeah, we, so much here. We should probably do yeah, more than just we, talk about John one. Well, yeah, it, it, this, I think this is a great segue also uh, for moving into Isaiah um, in this in this recognition again that it is not for one, it is not simply for Israel, but that Israel is to be a light to the nations, mm -hmm. and um, so I give you as a light to the nations that the promise and peace and healing and wholeness and filling the salvation of God. Um, may reach to the ends of the earth. And and when, when we pick up the baton only for our segment, we follow the segregation of the society. But when we pick up that torch to be the light of God for God's cosmos, to use words that Caroline reminded us of last week, um, then it becomes a promise for all the world. And Sometimes I dare to say that um, in, in a segregated tone, at its best, the black church is a demonstration of what the church universal should be. And that is to bring testimony to God's faithfulness to a people in times of trouble, to offer mm -hmm. hope and to fill their hungers and needs. That's mm -hmm. the good news. And Isaiah mm -hmm. says that's what the call of Israel is about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agree. Yeah, well put. <laughs> yeah, that's great. All right. How about the psalm? What would you do with the psalm? Well, the it's psalm begins with a, 
Yeah, it is. And it's um, the, the opening line. I waited. How did I wait? I waited patiently. And, and it means that this isn't going to come right away. And right now, my frustration is that it hasn't come. Um, there were hopes and dreams that I had as a child that did not prepare me for this moment uh, a year after the new definition of January 6th. Um, and the, the psalmist says to us that it's not burnt offerings and sin offerings that God is required. It's that we would do God's will. And at some point or another, doing God's will seeking God's will, waiting for God's kingdom to come means we have to wait in patience. And what I noted was that if you speak God's truth long enough, um, at some point you're going to move from a superficiality to a depth. And uh, the commentator notes that that there are two portions of Psalm 40. It begins as thanksgiving and it moves into lament. And that's real. That, you know, we begin saying things aren't as bad as they used to be. Things aren't as bad as they could be. And, and, and God's shown up and shown out. But, and when we get to that but, um, we have to acknowledge a bit of lament. Um, and so this psalm might be the closing of the sermon um, because it gives vocabulary for the text of the day, it, re, regardless of, of which of the texts you use. Um, it ends with this sense of waiting patiently on the Lord, but also recognizing that it is God's will, not ours, that we must mm -hmm. delight in. Mm -hmm. For me, it also, well, at least the 11th verse answers the question Jesus asks, right? what are you looking for? Mm. That God would not withhold mercy from me, that God's steadfast love and faithfulness would keep me safe forever. Mm -hmm. um, of course, Jesus answers that in his own person, in John and the other gospels. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if people, I, I imagine some people would get stuck if the, if the preacher's question was, what are you looking for from God? I mean, I I think people who spend all their time in seminaries, like the three of us and, and most of our listeners, could think of all sorts of really creative and lovely answers. I think a lot of folks would be kind of like, can I really ask for anything? I mean, what would that look like? Some people know right away, right? It's good health. It's a restored family, all sorts of things. But this idea of if people need the, this is what the Psalms are great for, right? If you need to borrow mm -hmm. language, mm -hmm. verse 11 might might open that up to you. And then you I have think, to say what, Caroline? Come and see. Well, yeah, and I think too, I, the the verse that I, the verses that uh, really connect with some of the things that we've been talking about in terms of this call to witness and John, not the Baptist, being John the witness, and and behold, and look, and uh, and that verses nine and ten, I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. See, I have not restrained my lips. Uh, I have not hidden your saving help within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your love and faithfulness. And so that's, um, I think that's really interesting language in terms of what we've what we've spoken about and that theme of witness and testimony and how, uh, and it goes back to the, some of the other themes that we've been talking about with regard to that, that this faith and this baptism and this, uh, this relationship with God is not just about you. It's for the sake of the world. And so, and even maybe, maybe, maybe to think about with people, what prevents your testimony, what prevents mm -hmm. your witness, what restrains your lips? Uh, what what uh, what keeps your heart locked rather than being open and revealing of God's love? And so I think that would be also, or like you said, Matt, what is it? What is it that prevents you from answering the question? What are you looking for? Uh, what? So those kinds of invitations to 
I think would be good in this that kind of sermon. And in the recognition of the testimony, I think uh, 1 Corinthians, which is that opening greeting, um, but uh, in verse 2, that, testi that testimony is we are called to be saints together with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's the welcoming table. That's the beloved community um, that Martin Luther King, the preacher, was prophetically proclaiming in what we sometimes think is merely a civil rights movement. Yeah, and then in verse six, I mean, it, the, the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you so that our testimony strengthens Christ's testimony. Yes. Right? And so, so is it, I just want to, uh, first of all, I, I just want to pause and say to our listeners, I get this, we get this question all the time. Like, do you script this? Like, do you plan this all out? And I'm going to talk about, you know, this is our themes for the, we don't, we, we, we look at these texts. We have our own experiences in our lives. We think about the season and, and what are we drawn to? And here we are, we've can, we're, we're now in first Corinthians and all this language of testimony and witness. And uh, I just want to say, what a lovely spirit moment thing. Anyway, uh, we should also note, and we can get back into the uh, the more the details of the of the text in a minute. But we should also note that this is the first of five Sundays, I believe, of First Corinthians. So, uh, and the commentary mentions that there could be, you know, you could do a, a sermon series even on First Corinthians. So that's a whole nother direction one could use for epiphany, but this is the first of five, if I'm correct, uh, uh, readings from First Corinthians. Anyway. Which is a great series. I mean, these are, these are some really important chapters, I think. And if it's where you're, if you discern this is where your church needs to be for these five weeks, there's a lot you can do here. Uh, next week, we will see that Paul identifies the main problem in Corinth. Uh, the divisions, which is less about people are in different camps, and I think more about the superiority complex that comes along with these divisions and this, the sometimes the pettiness and just the factionalism that's that's part of it. And so, notice that how he starts without with no scolding, no correction. First, it's you have everything you need, yeah. and that's not in a kind of like look at how privileged you are, but it's God has provided you with everything that you need. You are lacking in in no uh, spiritual gift, right? Among you, there's all there's just this wealth of of um, what's the word I want besides gifts? Yeah. You know, what I mean, of of potential That's and possibility, potential. right? Because of what God has done for you, you know. And if you read Second Corinthians, it seems that First Corinthians didn't exactly fix the problem. So, you know, and maybe division is just always a part of how we're unfortunately hardwired as human beings, not to say we don't try, but it's always this question of given all of the, the gifts that God has blessed you with, what are you going to do with all of them? Mm -hmm. So Nancy Lammers Gross gets at this um, towards the beginning, right? How is Christ made manifest in our midst when we are called together with those who practice the faith differently or make claims that we strongly disagree with? Because of course, my inclination is let them find their own church. You know, we're doing it this way here. Um, we'll get a lot more done that way. But there's, that's the calling, right? Given the variety, given the disagreement, which, you know, be nice if it went away, but probably is not. What does it mean to then manifest these gifts in ways that are charitable, mm -hmm. in ways that make for peace? It becomes such a countercultural community to be able to say differently than the political parties that we're a part of, the state and national boundaries that we divide, what college you graduated from or what basketball team you root for, where we get into our Warriors. camps. We, oh, <laughs> Sorry. I will go with you on that one. I'm not going to get, see, <laughs> we've already got a problem because we're already found our right camp. Uh, but um, it, it's not that, it's being able to say, 
there's something that you can learn by looking at the Lakers. There's something that you can learn uh, by, yeah, I had to say it. I, I just had to offer that generosity. But that the gifts that we've been given are when we all come together. And it's not the gifts of this one particular group over against that, but that we need each other. And if you if you think of the way it used to be before you could go into a superstore that, you know, um, I remember when I was first introduced to Myers Thrifty Acres, which is a Michigan version of Walmart. And I would say to my students, where'd you get that? You know, where'd you go grocery shopping? And they'd say Myers. And I'm like, okay, I'll go to Myers. And then I'd see a coat and I'd say, oh, that's a nice coat. Where'd you get that coat? And they'd say Myers. And I'm like, okay, I can get my clothing at the grocery store and you know oh where where'd you pick up that picnic basket Myers and and that's sort of what we're supposed to be as a community we are supposed to have these separate gifts that serve the whole and not you have to go over there and it's only that and you go over there and it's only that and I don't know if folks can use that metaphor or not but there's something really nice about being able to go to a superstore and get everything that you want and not have to spend three days in shopping because you got to go to one side of town or the other. I like the idea of thinking the people of God might be a community of diversity that gives folks a little bit of what they need. That's right. That's right. You could also say we support small business owners. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. That was just a metaphor. <laughs> I get it. But, you know, the witness of Walmart. Uh, I, <laughs> I think one more thing that I would mention uh, here is going back to what makes witness possible, what makes uh, what makes testimony possible, is uh, is in part uh, affirmed here, as you mentioned, Matt, that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift, and so it goes back to also that that the witness is possible because of the presence of the Spirit that shows no partiality <laughs> and that that all of us have that the spirit that uplifts and accompanies and and uh is that companion and that helper and that guide and that aid and teacher to use a little bit of uh johannine paracletisms and so uh, that that you know so that we wonder how is this even possible and that we're reminded constantly that you are not lacking in, in any spiritual gift you've been given i love what you said matt everything that you need because that god's spirit is in you and among you all y'all and with you in 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 giving witness to god's gracious love <laughs>